the National Digital Library project is one that we needed for a very long time for two reasons. One, we don't have enough special libraries to cover the whole of India. And second, we needed to uh, pool the digital resources that we have in the country, especially in science and technology, because electronic resources in the sciences are very expensive. And our educational institutions, they some, sometimes they simply can't afford. Now the access to something that is, uh, that is very important for research in any of the areas of the sciences and technology, may be there in, let us say, in the IIT, but may not be there in a college somewhere else in India. And on the other hand, say five I IITs may be subscribing to the same thing. Now these are some of the problems that we have had. At the same time, we have to realize that NDL will not solve all problems because there will be questions of issues of copyright, commercial rights, and so on. But even then, it will go a very, very long way if we can pool, pool these resources. The NDL, to start with, uh, has on board the digital repositories of many scientific and technical institutions. However, you must realize that not every Indian student is going to read uh, the basic sciences or technology. So at some point of time, we would also need the digital resources of the public libraries of India, right up to the level of the depository, four depository libraries of India, to come in a kind of virtual uh, electronic network which would be accessible to readers. Only then we would be able to solve this problem. What these resources will give to Indians is access. It will not give to Indians method. Method is irreplaceable and institutions will be irreplaceable because just look at it in this way. You will have books on mathematics, but there, there will be lessons on mathematics. But what to do with mathematics? What is mathematical logic? For that, you need to be instructed. So it is not as if you know, universities will become passe and teachers will uh, lose their importance and uh, relevance. But you must look at the hard facts economically that we cannot build 200, uh, 250 colleges a day to catch up to the, with the enrollment ratio that we have targeted for 2030 or even 2025. So this was, we should have started it long back actually. But now that we have started it, it's, uh, it's, it's doing well. And we hope to have, the problem however, is that, um, there are old collections of scientific books, etc., in colleges which do not have the funds to digitize them. So we will have to find a way of actually getting those resources digitized so that they can add to the pool that we have already from the more advanced and better funded institutions. We have talked about the science and uh, technology bit in the NDLI. Now, the, as far as the humanities are concerned, you see there's a problem here. There are a number of institutions, for example, IIT Kanpur, etc., who have a very rich collection in the social sciences. And not just the social sciences, but also in philosophy, for example. IIT Kanpur has a very rich collection of philosophical texts. And, um, Many of the IITs are now opening up uh, management uh, business schools, B schools. 
So it is not as if it's only science and technology that we are talking about. There are, there are, there are many uh, subjects which act as a kind of bridge. For example, linguistics in the ISIs or uh, linguistics, of course, is different from humanistic philology. But even then, we need these uh, to be part of the NDLI. Now, this is one thing that it is not as if it's only science, science and technology book. However, there are old public libraries and also institutional libraries which are not part of the NDLI uh, effort and which uh, need to be part of it. I'll give you one example. We are having a workshop uh, with the UNESCO. The UNESCO uh, has acknowledged the Goethe's Library of St. Xavier's uh, College, school at one college uh, in Kolkata as, um, as a heritage library and it has been digitized because that's the finest collection of books on theology, Christian theology that we have. What about the great Buddhist monasteries and their collections of manuscripts? What about the great uh, deposits of Sanskrit manuscripts in our country? These have to be made avail av available. Now, much of it has been digitized by the either National Manuscripts Mission or by special libraries in uh, universities. Now, if they are of they, if they belong to the universities, if they belong to the colleges, then they ought to be at some point of time part of the NDLI project. This is number one. And number two, those which have not been digitized so yet, who lack the, the, the institutions lacking the resources for digitization, there has to be some kind of effort, not necessarily from the government, also from the uh, private manufacturers and other funding agencies for uh, doing something about these neglected. I'll give you one example, the National Archives, which, are, which is not part of uh, NDLI for various reasons. They have a huge collection of unprinted, unedited, untranslated, Persian, Arabic, and Urdu manuscripts. 600 years of history there. So if you're asking me about the humanities, the historians would like to, you know, not everyone has the language skill. They, they, they need to have it, but not everyone has it. So these are some of the huge gaps that will be. But remember, we have just started. And these are things that will be necessary for advanced research. And for advanced research, you have to go and learn the language. But at the absolutely basic level, there are things which are there in the public libraries as well as some institutional libraries which should be part of the NDLI. We have digital education in the humanities. In fact, um, uh, sorry, not digital, distance education. In fact, distance education has succeeded more in the humanities and the social sciences than in science and technology, which re uh, require laboratory sessions uh, more than the other subjects. So the technology is our friend, uh, the friend of uh, humanities and the social sciences. Whether we have used it optimally or not, that's a completely different question. But to answer your question in a different way, there is a new subject called digital humanities. And there is a school of uh, digital computing at the University of Oxford, for example, and uh, various other leading institutions in the world. You'll be very happy to know that of the 10 top digital humanities centers in the world, according to a survey, world survey, uh, I think it was at Questia, I, perhaps it was, one was, was in Calcutta. A, the School of Cultural Texts and Records uh, of Jadupur University. And uh, what do they do? Look, if you do not have primary 
materials for research. Suppose you're a university set up in, let's say, the 21st century. You don't have old materials. Now technology is your friend. You have access to digital, uh, modern manuscripts. You can do digital uh, in-house. The School of Cultural Texts and Records was funded. They got three projects out of the British Library in London for their, what is known as the Endangered Archives program. So that there are many endangered uh, traditions of printing, publishing, writing, scripts, which needed to be preserved. So these were done at Jadupur University, the School of Cultural Text and Records. I think it's the only university apart from Shanghai in Asia which got so many uh, projects not only from the British Library, but from Australia and all over the place, from the Ministry of Culture gave it around, uh, granted around three crores, and they developed software for collation, collating uh, texts and uh, textual variants in manuscripts. So there you are. Without that collation software, you would spend the rest of your life. Do you know that uh, the person who tried to write a concordance for the Bible actually went insane? So now we have the computer, you just click and you get it. You know, you, even if you want to know how many times a particular word has been used by Shakespeare, you, you don't have to spend your lifetime doing that. So digital humanities has made life simple if only we are willing to accept that you know this great divide has to be bridged now scholars have been willing to bridge it long back uh, perhaps you know there was a debate a couple of years back whether we should have four years uh, at the bachelor's level or not you know what the uh, debate was about is that if you have three years uh, at the honors or the major level, then what happens is that you don't get a liberal arts. Uh, liberal arts also includes the sciences. So that you study the sciences and the arts in the, the first two years and then you major. Problem of course is again economic. Do we have enough staff, enough resources? Do students, parents, do, do they have enough money? to uh, pursue this kind of uh, syllabus. But much has to be said about bridging this gulf. And we know for certain that there are many subjects, take for instance psychology or the study of behavior. You cannot uh, say that uh, you know, this is humanities and this is, the, this is the science. There are many, many areas now. For example, uh, artificial intelligence works with people who are studying language. Without that, you can't. So dig digital humanities and computing in the humanities has become as important, you know. It's like, I shouldn't say as important as printing. I should say more important uh, than printing. So yes, it is not as if they, it's like the guru, you know, was speaking down to the chela. No, 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 the things, have, things have changed. Is number one. Number two, you have used that word preservation. Let me tell you that digitization does not necessarily preserve. Sometimes digitization destroys. One of the best uh, ways of preserving documents is microfilming. Once you microfilm, it stays unless there is a, you know, a fire or whatever. What is, the insurers call them acts of God. Uh, the, it stays at least 500 years. But uh, digital migration is a big, very big problem. Of course, we are solving it. The computer scientists are sol solving it. But digitization, let me stress this, is for access. The person with a little computer or a little Android telephone or you know, a, a cheap uh, mobile can get access to something for which they had to go abroad, travel. 
that is the great boon that digital technology has brought to us. Can you imagine that I had to actually uh, slink away from home, not telling my parents, and sp spend a night just to hear Amir Khan sing? Now digital technology, can, you can hear, hear, sing for three hours, no problem, because the All India Radio would not uh, allow you to hear, hear him for more than uh, 30 minutes. So it is not just preservation, but also access. I would like to stress this, that access is, is the real revolution, and what we need in India is access, more than preservation.